our goal is to include accessibility in the production as born accessible publication, but also in the distribution uh, channel, in the mainstream distribution channel. Why we move on that? Uh, because uh, there is uh, a new legislation at European level, the so-called European Accessibility Act, that has been uh, approved in 2019 and now is in the stage of implementation at national level. They should be implemented, the legislation should be implemented at national level by June 2022, so it's quite soon. I know that in Italy has been recently approved, it's not published well yet. I know that in Germany is under discussion, in France, in other countries. So, this legislation requires that a lot of product and service become accessible since the beginning. So, that are available on the market, accessible product and services. And one of the product and services that are included are e-books and the digital publication value chain. So not only the books, but also the website that sell uh, e-books, the distribution chain because they need to distribute the metadata describing the accessibility uh, information on the title to the end user. And so it's a completely different paradigm from what we are used. Normally the Accessible publication are provided in different channels, are created after the publication. So I think this is very important. The law will enter in force by June 2025, so the clock is ticking, and everyone involved in the publishing industry in the digital area should start thinking what they can do for implementing this legislation. With me, we have um, Gregorio Pellegrino, who is the Chief Accessibility Officer of Fondazione Lia. He will provide you an overview of the standard involved. We have uh, Gauthier uh, Chomel, that is a project manager at the ADR Lab, and uh, they are doing a quite interesting experience on the metadata display. And Melissa Raken from DeMarc, and they are working on the production uh, process to create accessible publication. And last but not least, Diana Ba Dia, uh, that is policy office of the Ministry of Culture in France. Uh, I leave the floor to Gregorio. Uh, I hope we have time for a second round of questions and from questions from you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Christina. I think I have to update my photograph for the presentations, <laughs> and I think it's uh, great uh, to speak about uh, specification after the lunch because it's great for siesta. <laughs> we started with Ivan, and now we have other specifications. So, okay, so raise your hand if you are disoriented by the different accessibility specification of ebooks. Okay, <laughs> raise your hand if you are in Madrid for the first time. Great. So. I've created an incomplete uh, map for navigating both accessibility specification and Madrid, because <laughs> there are a lot of specification. I will fly over the different specification, and then if you need more information, there are all the links in the, in the presentation. So first of all, uh, within the W3C, we have uh, more than uh, eight, 10 uh, specification for creating accessible publications, but actually not only for creating, but also for distributing and for consuming accessible publications. This is because it is super important to have the whole ecosystem accessible from the content uh, creation through the accessible reading. OK, so let's start. The first one, the most important, which is in the Royal Palace, uh, is the EPUB Accessibility 1.1. Uh, Ivan already mentioned it. Uh, it is a candidate recommendation draft, and the, the, the objective is to define the high-level requirements for creating accessible publications. Um, and it is widely based on the web content accessibility guidelines, which are the guidelines for creating accessible websites and it adds the requirements for metadata and for navigation, page navigation, and so on. 
Okay, secondly, which are quite near the EPUB Accessibility 1.1, and those are in Campo del Moro Gardens, we have the EPUB Accessibility Techniques 1.1. The EPUB Accessibility Techniques are a super important group note which focus on how to make accessible publications. With the EPUB Accessibility 1.1, we have the high-level requirements. In the techniques, we have the code examples on how to create accessible EPUBs in both version EPUB 2 and in EPUB 3. And then we can move to the Fixed Layout Accessibility Task Force. This is a brand new task force. We started uh, a few months ago, and uh, we are uh, creating actually two documents. Uh, one is a document, is a note, uh, which, is, uh, which are guidelines for content creators on how to make uh, Fixed Layout uh, EPUBs more accessible. And the second one is a repository of example files, example EPUB3 uh, fixed layout accessible files, so that the content creator can pick, up, pick a file, uh, do copy and paste, and do whatever they want. Um, there will be another speech uh, after this on uh, fixed layout and accessibility. I'm really curious on, how, uh, on understand how how it works, that solution. And the, the good thing is that we are working both in the W3C and out of the W3C on this topic. OK. Then we have the user experience guide for displaying accessibility metadata. So the first three ones were, were for content creators. This one is more for online catalogs, for digital bookstores, for digital libraries, and for platforms. It is a first version of a document. We are working on a new version with improvements. With improvements, uh, Gautier will, will speak about that. And it tells uh, online platforms how to display accessibility metadata in a consistent way to the end user. So that if the end user goes in different websites, in different uh, libraries, finds all, uh, always the same information on accessibility in the same way. And then we have the schema.org accessibility proprieties crosswalk, which is in the park, uh, uh, Retiro Park. I will call it uh, Metadata Park, because all the specification on metadata will be in the, in the park of Retiro. OK, and this is a crosswalk between schema.org and Onyx accessibility metadata. You know, we have these two standards. One is for metadata within the EPUB, is the schema.org, and the other is for metadata through the supply chain, which is Onyx. And they are a little bit different, so with this document, you have a crosswalk for mapping. But we also have another document which is quite important, uh, and we are discussing about it, which is the Accessibility Summary Authoring Guidelines. Right now, the, the specification requires that each, pub, each accessible publication have to have an, accessible, um, an accessibility summary, so a free text description describing the accessibility features of the file. Uh, since it is a free text, uh, any publisher, any content creator can write there anything. And so we are preparing guidelines on how to create an accessibility summary in a structured way. <laughs> then we have the digital publishing way area module 1.1. This is um, a different specification. It's not only for EPUBs. It helps content creators to add semantics to their content specific to the publishing world. I mean, in HTML, you can say that a specific content is a paragraph or a heading or a list or a table and so on. But you cannot say that that particular section is a chapter or a part or an introduction. I mean, all the different type of contents that we have in publishing, colophon, copyright page, dedication, and so on. With this specification, you can add this semantic in the HTML, so both on web pages and in EPUBs, to enrich the semantics. And I'm finishing. Uh, 
uh, Ivan already told about this document, which is the EPUB accessibility and uh, mapping through the um, European Accessibility Act. The, the, um, the place is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and European Union and Cooperation here in Madrid, which is, I think, this is the correct place for this document. It is a mapping that tells the EPUB specification, EPUB Accessibility 1.1 meets all the requirements of the European Accessibility Act. So if you produce EPUB, EPUB free, I hope, that are compliant with EPUB Accessibility 1.1, then you are compliant with the uh, European Accessibility Act. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh... As Gregorio said, we uh, are now focusing on many different aspects. The legislation requires that the content is produced in an accessible way, is distributed in online store that should be accessible, but also that uh, reading solution should be accessible, either if there are hardware or if there are software, because otherwise the end user will not be able to access the content in reality. The last element is the uh, information that should be provided to the end user, because in this concept, the people will buy the content. And so the people need to know before buying the content or getting in a library as a loan if the content fits their needs. And this is really, really important. So I leave Gauthier the... Thank you, Christina. Um, so as Christina just explained, it's a, it's a request from the European Accessibility Act. But um, the question uh, that raised in France was, how do we uh, ensure that the experience, the user experience, uh, will be first satisfying, but also uh, stable from one um, portal to another, from uh, being uh, buying, lending, or reading in your, uh, in your application. Um, so French authorities uh, asked the IDEA lab to, um, to raise some specification, but at this moment we, uh, we had the user experience guide for displaying XCBT metadata, you know our uh, cartography, uh, a mapping of different uh, uh, documents. So we started by, uh, by this document. Uh, obviously, we don't want to have a different experience in France and in other places. Uh, so we started uh, by uh, translating this document to, to French. Uh, then we gathered some uh, different examples of uh, existing implementation, mainly in uh, specialized uh, library for the blind. Um, so this is uh, some example we, we found. And uh, with this uh, example, we built um, a prototype. Uh, you have the, the address uh, here, so you can uh, check it. It's in French. Uh, so we built a prototype, and we uh, proposed uh, two uh, different workshops. Um, the first was asking, is the uh, uh, user experience proposed uh, sufficient? Uh, is it uh, understandable for, uh, for users? And the second was, is uh, this user experience uh, uh, realizable, doable? Uh, can we do this with, with uh, the material we have as a, um, as a retailer? Uh, so the prototype is online. You, you can check it if you want, if you understand French, or maybe uh, want to um, try the automatic translation. Uh, this is uh, less almost the prototype we, we've built. We, this is an, an extract. We have many uh, different uh, um, possibilities. And um, this workshop were attended by 50 persons uh, from uh, 38 organizations, uh, from publishers to distributors, retailers, and um, organizations representing a specific need for, for, for reading. So uh, organization for the blind, but also for dyslexics. 
um, and deaf person. And uh, the result of this workshop was that uh, we found there were more work to do. First, uh, all participants in the workshop uh, mainly found that the experience, the proposed experience, was a little too bit uh, discriminative, uh, dedicated to specific needs, and they wanted an experience more inclusive. Um, what raised that uh, some of the some of the um, information given for specific needs were in fact uh, useful for um, for many other users. So we've built um, a new prototype with less or more the same information, but uh, um, making the experience uh, more about uh, reading modes, uh, giving what are the functionalities. A uh, simple example is uh, uh, pagination uh, mapping to the, the original, the printed one. Uh, it's critical when you are in, um, uh, in a situation, uh, in a situation of handicap. when you don't uh, have a perception. Uh, but it's also very useful when you are an academic and you want to use the digital version and still having uh, the opportunity to get cross-reference with print version, as a printed page is the main uh, uh, reference used in, um, in academics. Um, this uh, feedback was... Um, given to the WCC group, and we know, we know uh, started, as commented uh, Gregorio, uh, to uh, review and, and think about a new, uh, uh, an update to the recommendation. Uh, but we can do this only with uh, feedback from friends that can be uh, uh, very specific and that can be um, with some bias. Uh, so, uh, we need feedback from other countries. I know that uh, there is one going on uh, in, in Italia right now. Uh, we welcome any organization uh, uh, over Europe, but also over the world, to make their own survey. Um, the prototype we, we've made is uh, fully, um, well, fully accessible, but it's also under a free li license. It's uh, on a GitHub account, so um, a GitHub repo, so you can uh, check it, you can reuse it, or you can do your own uh, prototype, but we invite you uh, to, uh, to make this type of survey so we can have a uh, large uh, experience. Uh, third axis is the vocabulary localization. We had many problems about uh, simple terms uh, that we use uh, daily uh, as an accessibility expert, starting by accessible. Uh, and when you're in France and you say accessible, uh, we had a uh, um, some portals and retailers that say, no, it's about uh, open access, <laughs> uh, it's about open edition, so uh, we have to rethink the vocabulary from a French point of view, from a national point of view. Um, this is a, a work in progress. We will have a, a national survey uh, by uh, this month of June um, to ensure that we get a common vocabulary and this will help us, this will help us build a, a glossary, uh, an online dictionary for accessibility in French. Uh, this is less or more the survey we are building. Uh, so the idea is to have definition, but also examples uh, and, and different level of, of information for understanding. Uh, last work uh, to do a cross work extension. So the document we have actually at the W3C is mapping Onyx to Schema, uh, but there are more um, more use cases uh, because we want the experience to be stable by uh, in in my reading system, in my uh, retailer, on my portal where I buy books, but also if I am lending, I want the same information. And there, they don't use. Uh, uh, so much Onyx, uh, they will use uh, Mark 21 or Unimark in France. Uh, so we are actually working on uh, extending this crosswalk to uh, to include this um, this set. Um, 
some positive impact we found uh, during this project um, on, on the ecosystem. First, we built an interprofessional collaboration because there was a workshop uh, with different actors from the ecosystem, from the publishers to the readers, uh, and the whole chain uh, started to uh, talk together. Uh, that's allowed us to build a common culture of accessibility. Uh, I hope that we'll have a kind of uh, definition portal that we could use uh, for, for, for the future. Um, this allowed us to contribute to the international effort, effort to the W3C, not from an on, only organization point of view, but uh, from um, an interprofessional uh, point of view and uh, to uh, come with the British we see with uh, a voice that is not our own voice, but uh, it's more large. And, um, and of course, I believe this will help uh, for other accessibility related uh, subjects uh, because if I know what I have to display to the user, if I understand what information the user needs, the reader need, so it's better, it's simpler to understand what I have to do on my files and what I have to do on my, on my workflow and how to indicate this. Uh, many thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, now Melissa will provide us with some information on the work they have done for the experimentation of production of accessible publication. Yes, so hi everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you today. So, um, oh, yeah, okay. Today I'm going to talk to you about what we did in Quebec with uh, publishers that we distribute there. So the way that we help them uh, get on board with accessibility. Uh, and I will talk a little bit also about distribution challenges with accessibility metadata. So before I start, just a few words about the mark. So uh, the mark was founded in Quebec in 1990. Uh, we are a digital books distributor since uh, 2008. We started distributing audiobooks in 2018. Uh, so today we distribute uh, more than 3 million e-books from more than 3,000 publishers and several thousand audiobooks as well. Uh, and in 2018, we also launched a NIPA production service to help our publishers who didn't have the resources to do it internally or who wanted a more reliable provider. Um, we also have partners in France and in Italy who use uh, our distribution platform, so it's Eden Livre and Edigita. Uh, so, yeah. We do many other things, I will get on that later, but I will focus on this for now. So, uh, yeah, why did we choose to make accessibility one of our priorities? Well, uh, it all started in uh, 2019. Yeah. So, when we knew that the, the European Accessibility Act was going to be uh, implemented, enforced in, two, in 2025 in Europe, uh, we knew that we, we had to get publishers going in Quebec as well and really get started on accessibility as uh, France is a big market for them. So we, we didn't want them to miss uh, this opportunity. And also, um, accessibility is part of the Marx uh, mission. It's always, uh, the Marx has been founded on the, on the fact that we want to help uh, people learn, students learn, and we want to bring books to readers. So accessibility is part of our core mission. So when we really wanted to, once we really wanted to get started on accessibility, we looked around uh, what was already being done in Quebec to get a little, a little bit of examples and to get some advice. And this is pretty much what we saw. So actually, <laughs> <laughs> there was pretty much nothing. So it was a desert. So in Quebec in 2020, no one was doing anything yet. Publishers didn't know about accessibility. Uh, they didn't even know why it mattered and what it meant. So we really had to start from scratch uh, and, and make up everything. So uh, what did we do exactly? Uh, so, we thought that the best way to approach accessibility in Quebec, since no one knew really what it was, 
uh, it was to start with uh, our own expertise, because we were just beginning as well. So since we had a production service, we started, adapted our own production service uh, to make it fully accessible with the help of NELS. Uh, so thank you to them. So they audited our ebooks and they gave us advice, and we, we did a few rounds of uh, rev revising the files until they were really accessible. While we were doing that, we also created uh, reference documents and guidelines in French that were really um, summaries of how to get started, why it's important, and re really just a baseline to give to publishers. And uh, once this was done, we, we, the first step was to, was to start raising awareness. So we wanted to make publishers understand why accessibility mattered, uh, before uh, getting them on board. So we didn't want to do that on our own. And in Quebec, we, are, uh, we have collaborated with the National Association in Quebec for, uh, since the beginning of our distribution platform in 2008. So instead of just going to the publishers directly, we decided that it was the best strategy to uh, talk to the National Association and to really collaborate together. So once we did that, um, I don't know, not working. Ah, yeah, OK. So and once we, we agreed on that, we uh, started doing uh, seminars and workshops, so really to uh, get the word going that accessibility was going to be one of our big uh, focus points and that it was really important to start very soon. So we did that at the end of 2020. We did several rounds of uh, seminars. And then in 2021, we created uh, video content. So we actually created uh, six videos of around 30 minutes, uh, going from the very beginning. So what is accessibility? Why is it important? What's going to happen in Europe in 2025? until the very end, which is how do you produce an accessible ebook? Why, uh, what do you have to do? Um, why do you have to produce an ePub 3.2 or 0.3 now and not an ePub 2? Because we have a majority of ePub 2 in Quebec right now. So really from the very start. And then uh, we went to different book fairs and we set up um, accessible books uh, booth where people could come and uh, we would inform them on what accessibility is. And we teamed up with uh, Vue et Voix in Quebec, which is an audiobook producer. So uh, we were together with them so people could see what audiobooks were and at the same time talk about accessibility for ebooks. So I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I'm going to explain a little bit the challenges that we met during all these phases, because of course it was not an easy road. Uh, it was very new to publishers, and there are many things that were complicated for them. So, first of all, the standards. Uh, so the W3C standards, the reference documents, are all in English. They are very technical, and uh, small to mid-sized publishers in Quebec are not used to that. And so uh, they, it was kind of scary for them to look at that. They didn't really know how to get a grasp of what accessibility really meant. And then uh, once they did get it, it's also how do you apply the standards to your own books? Like, what does it mean? What do I have to do to make my ebook accessible? Because it's so large. The standards are so large that you can really get a little bit lost on the structure. And then. Uh, once you do that, how do you make sure that each one of your books is uh, accessible, fully accessible? It's quite easy for a publisher who only publishes uh, novels, for example, to get like one workflow that is really efficient. But we have many publishers who publish novels, but also essays, um, handbooks. So they have like very simple to very complex files, and there is not one uh, solution for that. So. And the last challenge is the alternative text. Uh, this is still the biggest one, because um, alternative text is more work for them. 
they don't really know how to write alternative text, and they don't really want to take the time to do it, and so they would like, many of them would like to have an external service write the alternative text for them, which is not ideal, because, you know, an, ima an image can be interpreted in many ways, and it's up to the publisher and the author to know what they want to say with that image. So if you rely on, on someone else, for example, the mark, to do that, um, you might not get the right message out of your image. So, um, yeah, we, we created templates for them and resources to help them like, know exactly how the structure of an alternative text, the length that it should have, and you know, what they should focus on when they write them, but it's still, uh, it's still very hard for them. And then, of course, the resources. So, uh, once again, I'm talking to mid, small to mid-sized publishers, so they have very little time, they have very little knowledge. Uh, so, yeah, the time that they can give to accessibility is very narrow, like, it's very small, and it has to be, like, very efficient. And I think it's really important to understand that accessibility looks very di different uh, depending on different things. First, the publisher size. Uh, of course, it's easier for an, a big editorial group to produce very accessible ebooks because they have more resources and they can have whole teams that are dedicated to that. So we can see that most of the big five publishers uh, have accessible ebooks, uh, Achet Livre as well. Um, but it's not the same reality for a very small uh, Quebec publisher or even a mid-sized publisher in Quebec. It's not at all the same thing. Generally, there are a maximum of 10 people in a publishing house in Quebec, so, and they are not really fond of technology. So that's a challenge. And also the type of publications, because as I said, if you only publish novels, it can be pretty easy. But if you produce like um, handbooks with a lot of images, a lot of formulas, uh, and very complex structure, it can get really complicated. And also, who produces their ebooks and how they do it? Because in Quebec, we have a lot of publishers who have like um, external graphic designer who work on the design of the paper version, and then they simply export the, the EPUB from the InDesign uh, file, and they don't look at the EPUB. They just upload it on the platform, and they don't know if it's really correct, and uh, let alone about accessibility, like they, they really don't know what it is. So, yeah, the last one, <laughs> and not the least, uh, it's accessibility metadata. So once you've manage to do all of this, like to produce accessible ebooks, and you're finally ready, then you have to document accessibility metadata, and this is where it really hurts. Like, publishers don't know how to do that. It's the Onyx standard is really complex to understand for them, and it, yeah, they, they don't know what the, the labels mean, they don't know if it really applies to them, so you know they just click on a few things and they think it's okay, but actually it's not complete, or if it's not even correct. So, yeah. So what we will do in 2022 and 2023 is, um, yeah. So keep working with the National Association to uh, raising awareness is one of the things that we already achieved. So now it's more about how do you get started? How do you adapt your workflow? And how do you convert your backlist catalog? Because many publishers uh, after 2020 and 2021 started uh, producing accessible ebooks for new releases, but they don't have the resources to do it for the backlist. And the ANEL actually got funding from the government to help them produce uh, accessible backlist catalogs. So this is what's gonna, this is gonna happen this year until June of 2023. And this is really going to help us, the government is gonna pay for a large amount uh, of the production. Yeah. And then of course, we're going to keep creating and updating our resources as they go. Because as I said, publishers in Quebec don't necessarily speak English, they're not really um, comfortable with that, so we try to maintain French documentation as much as we can. And I know that Nels is doing that as well, so 
they actually have a good um, database today. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I will hurry. So we will focus on accessibility metadata because, as we, as I said, it's uh, hard for them to give them the give us the metadata. So we will try to find ways to get them ourselves. So probably extract them automatically. And we will focus on accessibility in our ecosystem, because what I didn't say earlier is that at the mark we have a marketplace, an e-lending solution, and reading apps. So we have a whole ecosystem in which accessibility must be our focus, like how do you display them to the users once you receive the metadata. So, yeah, <laughs> that's it. Actually, and I didn't speak about Spain because it's the, after that I stop, I swear, uh, because it's the very beginning. So Spain is going to be, uh, we're going to do in Spain what we did in Quebec. We're going to try uh, starting now because it's very early and publishers don't, don't know about accessibility much here. And I think that's it, but um, I don't know. It doesn't, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just uh, it was very interesting. Just uh, two clarification related with the Accessibility Act that I think uh, they are important. One is what uh, Melissa said: the Accessibility Act requires every actor who want to sell product and service in Europe should comply with the requirement because the goal of the uh, Act is that European people have access to product and services. So if, even if you are a, a Canadian, Japan, Japanese, uh, international actor, if you want to sell in Italy and in Europe, you should comply with that. The other important element, there are uh, some exemption. One is for micro enterprises. So organizations that are less than 10 employees or with uh, um, revenues of less of uh, less than 2 million euro are not uh, uh, compelled to comply with uh, the legislation. So these are two important things that I think will be important. The third element is that Canadian government has been very helpful because they have uh, given a lot of funding in the area of uh, publishing uh, to support the transition of the uh, Canadian uh, publishing industry towards accessibility. So I think this is a very good example to follow, possibly, also in Europe. Tiena Ba, thank you. Hi. I have no slides. It's a good point. <laughs> I, am, I am sorry for that. I'm going to be a better student <laughs> next time. So you are allowed, if my accent is not good enough to, you know, <laughs> and I'm going to look at you, and if you do not understand, just... I'm not a susceptible person. We heard today lots of technical stuff. And uh, when I was beginning my job, I was about to cry many, many times, because I'm not a technical expert or specialist on um, informatic and e-books and guidelines and metadata and displaying in 1.1, 2.3. One, one, so I really was about to cry and I was wondering myself, how am I going to explain to people that I'm doing this job without being an expert? And I met lots of association and blind people and deaf people and people with dyslexia. And I learned two years ago that they have no access to 90% of books. So some of the children cannot keep on going studying and some people cannot get a job or a better job, or they just cannot go to some places and understand what is happening. And then I really found what was my job in this Ministry of Culture in France, and 
the story of this ministry is really built on one goal, to make culture, art, accessible to everyone. And I was really surprised to imagine that such a part of the population were not allowed to read. So, then I decided to understand the technical stuff because in 2025, it's really going to change lives. So it's not just a digital transition, <laughs> it's a societal transition for people who are going to get access to, perhaps, I hope so, 50%, 50%, perhaps. That's why the Ministry of Culture is really involved in an um, interdepartmental committee that was set up five years ago with other ministries and with all the actors of the chain book and also the association who are supporting uh, people with disabilities and who are doing such an amazing job to help them to get access to, to books. In this committee, uh, professionals are working on thinking about what needs to be done to be sure that the job that publishers are doing now, accessible e-books, are really going to be accessible at the end of the chain. Is it okay to this? <laughs> so it's mean. Do all the publishers are able today to make e-books on this EPUB 3.3? Do all the publishers are able to implement this EPUB accessibility guidelines? How are the association who are working so hard to adapt printed books are going to do with these new born accessible books? Because now they are going to say to the user, wait for a minute, I'm going to see if they're e-born accessible books, and we have to see if this book is responding to your needs, and if it's not responding to your need, then we are going to adapt it. It's going to be a big change for the association. How are going the libraries to do to explain all the stuff? How are we going to help people with disabilities to get better equipment and the reader um, to read all that. How are we going to involve and train the smallest publisher who have not so many funds to do that? So all this committee is thinking, is trying to think about all these issues and we have not all resolved, but we are working on it together with the retailers, with their lab, <laughs> with some, uh, lots of organizations, and we've been working on all this subject uh, for five years. And this is this committee who have asked, for example, to Adrier Lab to do the job that Gauthier were talking about. So we are funding all this kind of project. The last one was to commission a cabinet to study the economic impact of all this, how much is it going to cost? I saw a lady who is doing <laughs> So how much is it going to cost today in France if nothing is done to work together to mutualize, as you said, mutualize, to mutualize something? So today in France, with several publishers producing e-books differently. Are you ready? For 33,000 books produced 
every year. If we want all these books to be accessible, if you have a check, you can start. It would cost 68 million. If you take all the books on the market today, that's the big issue, the books already done, they are here, and we don't want them to be removed by publisher because it's going to be a disproportionate burden. So just imagine we are in a Martin Luther King world. All the books, making them accessible. So it's 500,000 books in France on the market. It's going to be 700,000 million. Someone did that. <laughs> Seven, oh, oh, and million after. Do you imagine? When you are in France, e-books are not sold much. The printed books are more important. So do we imagine the investment? But there are some exemptions. So if you remove, but just imagine the impact for the person with disabilities. If you remove the books from micro-enterprises, if you remove the book that we know, it's going to be a disproportionate burden. If you remove the books, because there is three exemptions, that that's going to change. How do you make comics accessible and to replace all the, all the, thank you, the bubbles and the images by alternative text? It's not a comics anymore. So if you remove all that, it's still 50%. 50% of the production, so 17,000 books, then it's going to cost between two and five million. Some are smiling. Yes, it is. <laughs> and if you remove the same kind of exemption for the books who are only on the market, it still is. 100 million. Today, without organization and without an industrial solution, today we cannot say that we have an operator ready to take all the books and put them in a chain and make them accessible. So we have to invent something. That's why the impact, it's not only to change uh, men and women and children's lives. It's also for all of us to improve our way of working, like you were saying, working together and, and sharing competencies. Does this a competency? No, skills. Sharing skills <laughs> and talking together like, uh, like we are doing. So for us, for France and for the Ministry of Culture, there, is, there are three big issues. With all that money we are ready to put in this change, all the chain has to be accessible from the production to, <laughs> to the tools to read the books. That's really the, one of the biggest issues. The second one is this backlist. How are we going to do that? How, how is it possible to do that in three years? And even if we are able to do that, this work has to be respected. It means that the association has also to change the way of choosing the book they are going to adapt. There's a third issue, but I forgot it. I, I, it's going <laughs> to... <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back. So that's what I can say today about uh, where we are. And this uh, study we made with this cabinet, we don't ask the cabinet to do the study. It was really uh, how do you, enthusiastic because 
this cabinet worked because publisher, expert, a DR lab, all the professional gave some data to make them able to modelize all that. So it was a very big step because we are all occupied in lots of things. And uh, people with disabilities are used to that. We are always occupied. But this study makes us beginning the work of how are we going to do, how is it going to cost, and what are going to be the impact uh, for us, for, uh, for us uh, all. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really We are going to do the similar evaluation for the Italian market because the real risk is uh, that the publisher decide to take off a lot of title from the catalog because uh, they now leave the e-books because there is no uh, cost of inventory or uh, uh, things like that uh, as it is for the paper book. But if you have to spend a lot of money to create the accessible version, then maybe you decide not to leave the title in the catalog. So this is uh, one of the risks. And we also work very closely with the Federation of European Publishers and the different ministry with the Commission because we also highlight this problem to the Commission because when we discuss the, the, the directive in the beginning with the Commission, the evaluation they have done was on the new title because we were speaking of born accessible publication, not of conversion of existing titles. So this is a, a slightly change that arrive in, in, the, in the implementation of the legislation at national level. That is something that we will try to find solution also maybe to have a little more time to convert all the title, uh, not exactly for the 25, because it will be very, very difficult. The other thing I think, uh, I leave you the... Uh, I remember the third one. <laughs> so. I'm sorry. The most expensive part in the number I gave you, it means 80% is the alternative text. Yes. That's really the part uh, which is the most expensive because it's a new activity and you don't have for the moment a, a machine or artificial intelligence re ready to recognize all the images and to propose an alternative text. So with the number I gave you, you can take 80% it's writing and integrating this new activity, alternative text. Yes, this mm. is important. And I know that in US, for example, some publishers are also changing some of the contract because they are putting this activity also on the author side because for some images it's very difficult that someone else can describe the uh, images correctly but it's a completely different. And this is an area where I think the collaboration with the specialist organization will be very important because on the other side, they are very expert on that because it's not just creating a caption. You, you need to provide further information to the people and you need also to describe the images in the context of the text. So if there are already existing information, you don't have to duplicate them. So this is something mm -hmm. where we have done a pilot project to f at least categorize the images in an automated way, that it could be also a, a, a first step. And the goal is to do some experiment, uh, experimentation with uh, um, artificial intelligence that cannot be perfect, but could be at least the first uh, uh, draft and then the editor can do the, the second part. So this is an area where I think innovation and technology mm -hmm. and uh, collaboration will help a lot. Uh, I think we have some time. If you have any question, if you're not dead with the number, <laughs> I think it could be interesting. Or comment or suggestion, it will be helpful. Well. The comment could be that I think uh, for next year will be the AI commenting and mm -hmm. describing images will be really mature to do the job mm -hmm. quite quick. So 
Actually, there is something that is going to happen next week that is a bit freaky, and is the Eurovision of uh, artificial intelligence. So there are different countries that are competing to do a song with the letter and music and images just done by artificial intelligence. And the result is not so bad. So in Spain, they are doing a group with that teach uh, an AI to um, write Galician in two weeks and then to write a song in Galician in two weeks. So I think it's going to be quite fast. Mm. Gregorio may. Yeah, I, uh, not to be too technical, we. Um, we presented at the last uh, Digital Publish Summit our, uh, our experiment on this, uh, and what we found is that uh, uh, AI works quite well for photographs, uh, but a lot of images within books are not photographs. Uh, there are charts, logos, uh, mm -hmm. covers, uh, a lot of other types of images. We mapped uh, 27 types of images, uh, infographics, uh, uh, maps, uh, comics, uh, and so on. So uh, it, it really depends. And for each kind of images, you may require a different algorithm. And the second uh, issue there that I can see is that those algorithms uh, normally uh, return a, a description in English, and then you have to translate it maybe automatically, but then you add errors. And so for sure, those are improving a lot. Uh, I'm not sure if in one year we will have a solution that fits all the needs of, of the publishing industry, which is quite uh, wide. But I, I think that uh, as we have seen in this year where we work with uh, accessibility in publishing, the thing improves. So you mm -hmm. have, uh, maybe you don't solve everything, but you start solving yep. some of the issues. Mm -hmm. And so for some categories of book, the uh, technological automated uh, uh, solution works quite well. And so you have just a little bit of additional work. For example, in Fundazione Lia, we have a, a platform that manage all the workflow. So we receive automatically the file of the ebook from the distributor. We have a certification process uh, where we check the file and we create the metadata, and the metadata are automatically created and redistributed to the distributor. So for trade book, this is a quite simple solution. Now we are now working in different uh, uh, market segment. So we are working very closely. For example, here is uh, uh, Il Mulino. They produce academic books. So we work on the platform and on the textbook uh, that are more complex. And we are now working also with educational publisher, where you can imagine the complexity of the book are much higher. And also the number of pages. Uh, there are three volumes uh, plus uh, exercise and so on. But uh, I think that we, we don't, we cannot solve the problem altogether. We need mm. to go Friends. step by step mm. and segment them. Yep. And I think it could be in, in not many, many years to, to find solution for at least some part of the catalog. That I think it would be at least uh, important. <laughs> If you want to have more information on the implementation of the Accessibility Act, uh, we have done a paper on the DIA Foundation. You can find it on the website. It uh, can be downloaded for free. And it has been also translated in German in collaboration with uh, the, the uh, Bersenverein. So you can also find the German version. And, and in uh, Japanese also. And, and in Japanese, I don't know <laughs> if you can read it. Uh, <coughs> but it uh, provides you an overview with all the details of the uh, exemption, the implementation, mm -hmm. the standard, and so on. So if you think useful, it's uh, there. Just a comment um, regarding the alt text. Uh, just two weeks ago in the US, we had quite a lot of um, arguing regarding the, what actually alt text should be, because there are still like three different courses of alt text is something that describes technically what's on mm. the picture, or it describes if something that author wanted for you to be shown to what you interpret out of the picture, or actually 
uh, define something that is, uh, so the text is something combined with the caption of the picture itself. So it's still, for the publishers and for the alt text creators, it's still the same dilemma like it was with metadata like a decade mm -hmm. ago when we didn't know what to actually put into those things. So we still think that um, the, uh, the, the result of the debate was actually to, so the alt text should actually describe technically what is the, on the picture, not interpret anything else. So this was the end result. So as the blind person actually goes with the screen reader or device what it's using, it actually just needs to technically see what's on that picture without any interpretation. But this is still something that it's not clear what actually uh, are the courses, how to produce the old text. Yes, it really depends also from the kind of books. Because it's really related, if you are doing a textbook, it's a scientific uh, image, uh, it's an issue. If you put, uh, let's say, the Berlin Wall in an economic book, it could have a completely different intent uh, than if you put in the history book. So there is a, a, a lot of also editorial mm. choice that you should do. I agree. It's not, uh, it's not uh, a math uh, yeah. formula. <laughs> And there is another argument. Is, is it really possible to describe without interpretation? <laughs> without? Is it possible? Interpretation. Mm. This is philosophy. So, <laughs> for example, do you, do you, for example, describe, do you give the color? Uh, if you're looking, we're, we're working a lot with the blind persons. Mm -hmm. uh, we are doing the web accessibility tests and we have a task group consisted out of all different of accessibility problems there. And one of the things is actually the blind person, which is actually blind from the birth. So it means it doesn't have any memory of at all, it's which is different. used to be as base for, let's say, uh, blindness and accessibility considering this thing, you're building from the scratch. So you are building images from the scratch. And this means you're not building images from some memory or something like that, the mm. taste, colors, the feelings like that. You need to be technical as much as possible, just technical, to, to build his imagination, mm. not to impose your imagination. Because the difficulty we are all going to have is you said blind people. And this directive is for all kinds of disabilities. Mm. It's even for someone who has an accident and who is not able for a temporary time to read. That's why the goal is really difficult. The, the description has to, <laughs> to fit with blind people and has to fit, for example, with someone who is dyslexic and has to fit with someone who has other disabilities. That's why it's so hard. It's a directive who are really putting us in the front of what we call universal accessibility. So you, even if you stay from the scratch, I understand that, but you're going to have Different. several stages to, to make it accessible for the more, the largest uh, people. Yeah, but uh, if you're uh, considering cognitive accessibility or stuff like this, we always take this as a layer. So okay. the European Accessibility Act does not define which things are. When we are evaluating the web accessibility, we know which are the things that needs to be evaluated for a person with uh, head injury, for a person with blindness. And okay. These are bases that we are on. Otherwise, there will be actually, it's already too much of everything to be put in the one ball. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is why I, we said how to approach for the blind, for a person with disabilities, with head injuries, with other things, with whatever, flashing images and stuff like this that always okay. occur. Thank you Thank very you. much. <laughs> I think we have a, a coffee there, and then we have two other presentations on accessibility. I really thank the speaker. I think thank it you. was very thank interesting, you, and I think we will have a lot of 
other occasion to discuss the different topic more in detail. Thank you very much. Thanks.